third feature that you're producing in the Maritime. Uh, it's one of the things that's unique about it is that it's been uh, filmed almost exclusively, perhaps exclusively, around Nova Scotia and Halifax and certain mm -hmm. monuments. Uh, tell us about the tell us about the, the making of this movie. Uh, well, the making of Blood Fight uh, was very different than my first two feature films, uh, which uh, I jumped in that I actually have funding now. Uh, I never had funding before, I was just funding everything on my own. And where I got my funding was actually from the Japan Film Society of New York, which makes me actually the first person in Nova Scotia history to actually ever have funding from them. So, I mean, they didn't give me, a, like, billions of dollars. They gave me $7,500, and they said, if you can make a feature film on $4,000 and $5,000, let's see what you can do with almost 8000 So I was like, okay. And I managed to be very lucky, too, and I got a lot of uh, professional fighters, like, you uh, know, who's going to the next Olympics for Canada for Taekwondo, who's one of the main fighters in the ring as well. Uh, so I got really lucky to get real, like, sort of world-class athletes, and they're all Canadian. Uh, uh, all of my films were entirely filmed in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Blood Fight is about... 95% filmed in Nova Scotia, and I filmed everywhere. I filmed in Oxford, Halifax, Bedford, Lower Sackville. So I've literally filmed all over Nova Scotia, and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I still have all my crazy stunts that people uh, love to see, you know. Uh, I got sword fights on beaches, uh, I'm jumping from building to building, I'm lighting myself on fire, you know, with like no fire extinguishers or anything, I'm just wearing three pairs of jeans, the third pair of jeans is soaked in like styrofoam and gas overnight, and I just light myself on fire, bounce off trampolines, go up high in the air and kick two guys in the head and then land in a, a pond, you know, and put the fire in. So that's kind of the crazy stunts I do that people are getting used to seeing. And, we went six weeks where we couldn't film Blood Fight because I actually cracked two ribs. So, yeah, I was out for a while with Blood Fight. And uh, my movies are all real contact hits. Uh, so real punching, real fighting makes for a real action film as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so a lot of people sort of said I almost took, like, reality TV and made it into an action film <laughs> if you, in a, on a fighter's sense of view, I guess you would say. And... Uh, my background, uh, I, uh, I was a Canadian uh, full-contact Kimite Karate champion. I'm a fifth-stand black belt in Shotokan Karate, and that's kind of my background. I've also uh, held uh, seven different lightweight provincial, and or, well, two of them are actually state titles in kickboxing. So, fighter-wise, that's my background. So I am a real fighter at heart, so I sort of really put that back into movies. And... Uh, I don't know, a lot of people say if you like Jackie Chan mixed with, like, Jean-Claude Van Damme in a blender, you'll kind of get one of my movies. So, if that's what you like, you'll really love one of my films. And uh, Yin Park, uh, who's here with me, he was my main uh, partner. It was like a buddy cop movie, Stalker and the Hero. And we basically played, he played a Korean preacher uh, who was helping me to find uh, all the different Asian girls that were getting kidnapped. Uh, by the French mob from Quebec. So, you know, we had French, we had Korean, we had Vietnamese, we had Filipino. I mean, we had... Quite multicultural. Right? Yeah, we, we really blended culture into Stalker and the Hero. And, you know, our opening scene, we actually have a huge Korean fan dance, actually. And I think Yin like that. I really like the Korean fan dance, <laughs> actually. <yeah. laughs> Tell us about the fan dance. What was it like? What did it look like? Um, it's um, just a basic Korean fan dance, you know. Um, actually, I have not seen many <coughs> Korean fan dance in my lifetime. <laughs> so actually, it was my um, like uh, second time of seeing the Korean fan dance. Uh, but um, in the aspect of uh, multiculturalism in the movie, mm -hmm. I really like that, and I think it's uh, also a very important part mm -hmm. of the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and you think uh, you think the the viewers like that there was that, uh, that that combination like uh, um, what do you think uh, viewers liked about the movie was it was it that multicultural aspect or wh how was it represented what was it like well basically um, um, the girls like, uh, who were kidnapped in the movie <laughs> uh -huh. they were basically all Asian girls and mm -hmm. we were trying to um, um, you know 
basically, we were basically, uh, we were basically kind of rescuing all these different girls. And one thing people said was a little costumey about the film is I made all the Asian girls wear traditional clothing, which is a little out of mind step because in like modern day times, you don't see girls wearing hanbok in their living room, you know, like that's traditional Korean clothing or kimonos, you know, the Japanese clothing. But I actually made it like the girls walk around like this in everyday life. So some people said that was kind of costumey, but I did that in a sense where I wanted to to show people, you know, so many people blend the different cultures together. Like they don't even realize that Vietnamese and Chinese are two different languages or Korean and Japanese. And I wanted to show people they're, they're all different languages, they're all different cultures, there's all something new that we can learn from them. And I wanted to sort of show that within my films, and each film I show something different. Uh, I had the Korean fan dance in Soccer and Hero, I had lion dances, dragon dances, uh, <coughs> a traditional Japanese tea ceremony. Uh, I had a traditional uh, Japanese dance where I had a girl dressed up like a geisha and another girl dressed up like a mako, and another girl playing traditional Japanese music at the same time. And this is in Blood Fight, actually. And it was actually filmed at the Shaba Law Center here in Halifax. And they actually have a traditional Japanese tea ceremony room. And we were the first people that were actually allowed to go in there and film. I was told that there was, like, big budget studios that wanted to go in there and film, but they didn't want to show what it was really all about. So the the Japanese community didn't want, and the Shadow Law Center, didn't want people going in there and filming and not showing what it was really all about. So they let me go in there and film for free, because I was willing to show what it was all about. And uh, yeah, I had the girls and all kimonos and everything, and it looked really nice. And uh, yeah, that's great. Blake, you play the uh, one of the lead villains in Blood Fight, the latest, the latest one, and this is your first time working with Elliot, is that correct? Yes, it's the very first time. What's your uh, What's your background um, in terms of fighting? So you must do some fighting in the movie, I imagine. Yeah, actually, um, I was trained uh, sort of on a crash course to use um, katana swords on a beach fight, <laughs> uh, which is uh, not excruciating, but very physical. I call it physical acting. And, and, um, it's just a, a, a blast. It was so much fun. And I learned, you know, a lot about the, the Asian cultures by playing this part and being involved in this film. And it just opened my mind up to the whole new ventures with, uh, you know, with culture, world culture. And it's just been amazing. How did the two of you plot with Katana? Sorry. Yeah, the real Katana, yeah. Wow. As well as, we actually filmed a lot of Blood Fight in St. Mary's in Dow. Uh, so I think a lot of the students were kind of like, you know, me running down the hall and like uh, breaking arms and necks and legs and uh, cutting a guy's arm off with a sword, slicing a guy's stomach open with his, like, you know, uh, size and everything. So we had a lot of... I, I put a lot of traditional weapons, like karate weapons, and it's great because I've now been asked to actually uh, do like a black belt magazine, like uh, instructional video on how to use size. So that's kind of interesting that I get asked to do that now. So uh, also on top of video difference, which is on Quinpool Road here in Halifax, uh, CD Heaven over in Dartmouth, uh, Nova Scotia, directly across from uh, the bridge, at the first of uh, next month, we actually have a director's cut to They Killed My Cat, which is coming out, which is going to have a couple added scenes. Uh, one of me ripping someone's heart out of their chest and, you know, going, eat my heart out and uh, different stuff like that. I've kind of manned the lines up a bit to kind of... So, um, <coughs> for, uh, most of the films are, are almost, or perhaps entirely filmed uh, in the Maritimes. Mm -hmm. And we are just chatting about Stalker and Hero, which is filmed entire, almost entirely in Brunswick. Um, with one scene in Halifax. Now, uh, Ian, you were an actor in Stock and the Hero. Um, what, did, what was it like filming the movie or being shot in, uh, in New Brunswick? What area is New Brunswick and, and what was it like? It is, uh, first of all, uh, I could see a lot of beautiful sceneries and um, when I saw myself in the beautiful scenery, uh, fighting or being totally in, like, in my character in the movie, I just really enjoyed the total um, filming, and also after editing the film, well, I would say the it's um, it's totally um, quite of an experience. <laughs> <laughs>
yeah, it's, it's quite a it's quite a challenge to, to make such a film, and this is the third time you've done it on such a low budget. Yeah, um, we it's really exciting. Yeah, we digitally animated planes blowing up as they're leaving, like you know, the Halifax airport. Uh, we digitally animated buildings blowing up, cars blowing up, uh, fire. We've actually had real fire and fireworks landing on top of like me and Yin. Uh, so yeah, uh, that was in Stalker and the Hero. Uh, we did a, a lot of crazy stunts. Uh, I'll let uh, Yin uh, maybe tell you about uh, his crazy stunt. Where yeah, the building stunt um, was um, just crazy. I mean, um, I just felt myself as a, like a free runner in a, like a, just like a free runner, and um, you know I have never I have never done such a like a free runner things or you know like just I think I have been thinking it's impossible to jump like from a building to another building and without getting hurt. What I did is I did it first and Yin kind of followed me and. Uh, we jumped from like a, a third story building onto the roof of a second story building and then after that we jumped down onto an air conditioning unit which was mounted onto the second story building and then from there we jumped down onto the ground and ran away and then climbed and flipped into the uh, third level of the parking garage. So I, I jumped through the, the double pane glass window and then when I hit the bottom the glass fell like on top of me. I had like like little pieces of glass, like, you know, there's blood on my cheek. Yun took this picture and he wrote happy birthday with the blood on my cheek. It was very intense because, <laughs> um, you know, we were a low budget and we don't actually have the safety glass and he actually used a real glass. So it actually made me very um, worried about it. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, like right after that scene, you know, I had like a real glass uh, picture frame smashed over my head to end the scene, you know, I also had a chair smashed over my head. Uh, we also had a lot of crazy special effects. There's one point where Yin, another stunt Yin did is he's having a fight on train tracks as trains are driving between them sort of deal. And these are real trains just going by. We actually, the cops were called on us on that one, <laughs> which was kind of fun. And then the cops found out we were just filming a movie and they let us finish the scene, but... Uh, uh, Yun was being almost thrown over the overpass. It was an overpass of like two uh, trains that were driving by. And this one under it was like cars driving. So the the villain was trying to throw Yun into the oncoming traffic, uh, which is probably about a 20 foot drop, I would say. Yeah. Almost half of my body uh, was uh, dangling on the bridge, which uh, supports the trick, like a. Um, um, Train rail, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. train rail, yeah. And then Elliot was, um, was, um, you know, uh, like a, like a holding my, um, my legs not to, like, uh, for me, so I will not be you know, falling down. Yeah, I'm actually falling down. Oh yeah, when the when the when the female police officer showed up, she said someone said they were trying to throw a a, a, a young boy <laughs> over the head. <laughs> and it was Yin, so it was kind of like. And then we ended the scene with me taking one of the railroad spikes and actually jamming it in the bad guy's uh, head. So oh, that's okay. how we ended it. So we got a lot of crazy special effects. I even take uh, a chair leg that's been broken and, and shove it through a bad guy's back as well. Uh, I slice open a guy's throat. I pop out a guy's eyeball and literally say uh, an eye for an eye. Uh, I rip out a guy's heart and go, eat your heart out. Uh, when I kill the main villain, my main line, you know, like Arnold, all these guys they tend to have a line, so I was like, I'm going to man it up and throw some lines in there. So I was like, sayonara is like pretty much my line when I kill the main villain now, so yeah. Mm. <coughs> well, uh, we're, we're all really excited for a blood fight to come out, so keep your ears tuned to that, folks, and um, we're going to go to some music now.